Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Seoul and to the International Vaccine Institute. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Julia Lynch. I'm the cholera program director here at IVI. So we hope you enjoyed your first day yesterday. Uh, you got the drive through the beautiful countryside. You got to see where a uh, call is made. And then I hope you enjoyed the dinner and cultural show. Was it was a good first day, good way to break in? So thanks to everyone who organized that event uh, from Foundation, from IVI, from UBiologics. I don't know if Rachel was here, uh, but we thought it would be a really great way to, to start things off and also break the first day of, of jet lag. So <laughs> hopefully that helped. Um, so IVI, many of you, you know, are familiar with, we're a UN chartered international organization founded now 25 years ago with a mission to discover, develop and deliver safe, effective and affordable vaccines for global public health. And developing a cholera vaccine was the very first initiative IVI took up now 25 uh, years ago and led with the help of many, many partners to the availability of Shankal and Uvicol, the products that you're familiar with. So considering our very deep roots in uh, cholera research and cholera vaccine development, we're very, very happy to be hosting this uh, event uh, here for the GTFCC um, OCV working group meeting. Um, we wanna you know, express our appreciation for coming all this way uh, to, uh, to have the meeting. And, and also for those online who may be in very different time zones and trying to uh, join from afar. So uh, again, thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over now to the GTFCC, Philippe. Uh, so I am not Philippe, but I will be uh, doing a very brief welcome. I'm Lucy Breakwell. I'm with the US CDC, but I uh, have the privilege of functioning as chair of the OCV working group. And Philippe asked me to just say a few words. Um, Julia, yesterday you missed me give my Oscar-like uh, thank you speech for all the participants. So uh, do you want to thank IVI for hosting this? This has been a great opportunity and I didn't get the opportunity to thank you. Um, and also, again, want to thank you, Biologics, Rachel and your team. Thank you so much for letting us come and see your premises in the middle of a um, inspection, no less as well. So very much appreciated. And um, given I spent so long thanking everyone yesterday, I thought I better come up with a, a different message for today. And um, one thing I took away with great pleasure from yesterday was that we have this opportunity to increase OCV supply to 53 million. If you'd have asked me Tuesday, I would have said, there's no way we're getting above 36 million for 2024. And so, um, but one thing that uh, was of interest to me was that that supply is perhaps not guaranteed. And so I wanted to, you know, it's dependent on various things that hopefully Rachel can talk to us a bit more about um, or clarify today through some of the discussions, but um, it struck me that maybe we as a group need to ask ourselves uh, what's our highest priority for this year and next year. Um, you know, the message I've been hearing ever since I've been part of this community is that we don't have enough OCB supply. And so um, as we go through the different discussions, one thing I think I'd like us to think about is um, and my proposal would be that our highest priority is that we ensure maximum OCV supply production. There may be different ways of getting to this, depending on different perspectives and priorities. But I think if we have this baseline agreement that our aim for 2024 is to maximize production, we can start looking at some of the nuances and the details for how to get there. Um, but just wanted that as you go through these discussions to think about, is that something we can do and how can we do it? So that when we come uh, either to the end of today or tomorrow, we can come away with a clear message about how we're gonna come together as a community to do that. So, um, and I don't have the agenda to say when the next session is, but it's Malika. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So today uh, we will have a long day and we will be discussing about the OCV use, uh, and especially first the morning on the outbreak uh, response, OCV use in the outbreak response, and in the afternoon uh, on the preventive use. So there will be presentations, there will be poster sessions, but also discussions 
uh, and we encourage you and we hope that uh, you can jump in the discussions anytime. And uh, we will start by the first uh, presentation, which is uh, uh, done by uh, Philippe uh, and me. And it's the overview of the OCVUs in the last 10 years. And I will give the floor to Philippe uh, for the presentation of the cholera situation. Bonjour à tous. So, C'est aussi une occasion pour vous obliger à utiliser vos headphones et pour que les gens puissent aussi euh, parler la langue dans laquelle ils préfèrent et aussi une opportunité pour remercier IVI de nous avoir, euh, IVI et Neobiologique pour la visite d'hier, mais c'était important qu'on soit là aujourd'hui. For the rest, it will be in English, mais feel free to use the language you prefer. Okay, so I, I'll, uh, so we'll go very quickly over the uh, uh, the overview, then I will hand the floor to Malika for the OCVUs and uh, the, the the review of what's happened last year. But so where where are we now? Okay, so I think it's a surprise to no one. I mean, you know, it's it's a resurgence of the seventh pandemic. Uh, uh, it's amazing the number of times that people are shocked, saying, "Okay, are you sure you can use the word pandemic?" Yes, I am deadly sure that uh, you know it's a seventh one. But you know, in the people who are not working in cholera, they have totally forgotten these kind of things. Okay, so for them, pandemic is uh, uh, COVID. It's uh, sometime HIV, but you know, it's this kind of thing. So we need to really, really remind the people that you know, cholera is not something which is new, but which has a major potential. The things which is uh, increasingly challenging is uh, we are seeing, and I will come back to that a little bit later, but unacceptably high case fatality rate. And this is uh, for me, uh, and I think for many people, a major step back in uh, uh, in all the progress we have been making. So not only the, the outbreak we are facing are led, deadlier, but there are uh, more of them and they are much larger than what we have uh, seen uh, uh, for a while in many countries, but very, very definitely for the past 10 years. So there are many countries that are now affected uh, after at least uh, three years without reported cases, but sometime decades. For Lebanon, it was more than 30 years. So if you look at the country that were on the list uh, in uh, of the roadmap uh, when it was established in, in 2017, we had 47 countries. If you look at the country that are now, that could be possible, uh, possibly list, we have 52. So the objective being to eliminate some of the country of the list, uh, the situation has brought additional country. So if uh, the classical factors, and of course we all know, and uh, uh, that you know the the, the uh, cholera is a very clear marker of vulnerability and uh, and poverty that affect uh, disproportionately the poorest. So this is of course continue to prevail, but the bi and change, uh, sorry, conflict and uh, humanitarian crisis are a major factor. But the things which also has very clearly changed since 2021 is the effect, the visible impact of climate change. Of course, we cannot link individual uh, cyclone, flood or whatever to the climate change. I think it's when you have the same country being affected by four cyclones in, the, in two years, in one year, one year, so two calendar year, but in, in one in one year, Okay, we know what it means. Okay, so many countries, including Bangladesh, the biggest, uh, the largest outbreak in Dhaka in 60 years, uh, the flood in Pakistan, uh, the, 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 the largest outbreak ever in Malawi, the, uh, the largest outbreak in Mozambique in 25 years, etc., etc., etc. So this is not just figures, this is fact. And the potential for this to be worse is enormous okay so uh fortunately now the winter is coming so uh, ukraine is off the list but we have country like libya venezuela whatever where importation of cases would be a disaster and we are also well, we don't have enough data but seeing more exportation from endemic country to new area so it can get worse Okay, so not going to go to the all the details, but uh, you know, as of uh, uh, the end of uh, last month, 
they were 23 countries for which we uh, we know that there is an outbreak. So that was, in a way or another, reported to WHO. Of those, uh, 24 still had an, uh, an active an outbreak. That compared to uh, 18 for the same period last year, 2022, was already a very, very bad year. And we have a 25% increase. And of course, the number of countries that were affected is not necessarily the same. So we have new countries that are affected. So, and again, this is not finished. The end of the year is usually the peak transmission in many parts of the world. Okay, so uh, uh, some part of the world are, are, are getting out of the peak season, like the Indian subcontinent, because the, the post monsoon uh, peak is, is coming. But uh, but Australia Africa will start uh, the the uh, the season. There is a hurricane season in, in in other part of the world, and of course we'll come back to that as well quickly. El Nino will change the game for a big part of the world. So this is just another way to show, uh, you know, uh, when we say that there are more and larger outbreaks, this is just a number of countries that have reported over than one, uh, uh, than 10,000 autochthonous cases per year. And that's just official data. And we know that the data are underreported. Okay. So, uh, so this is just, just, and of course, uh, 2023 is unfortunately not finished, but you know, this is just also to show the number of cases of very uh, large country affecting the country compared to uh, the previous decade and especially since the roadmap was implemented. So, this is an illustration that, you know, when we say that there are larger outbreaks, this is not just, you know, a view of spirit. This is a reality. So, uh, again, just to try to illustrate, when we say that there are more people dying, okay, so we know that the information that is shared with WHO is not representative of the situation. Of course, we know that, you know, 4,000 deaths reported worldwide, it's a very, very gross underestimate, and that's usually uh, concerned only the, for the country who are reporting this or who can report the deaths when they have the data. It's only the cases in case facility, in, uh, in the health facility, okay? So the, the, there is a gross underestimation. Yet, data are not reliable, but we can assume that the trend has not changed over here, okay? The same, uh, the same country. So if you look here, of course, there are some big players. Okay, so I took, this is just a number of deaths, crude number of deaths, so no incidents of deaths that were reported to WHO over the past years. Taking away the very large outbreak, we know that either were a real outbreak or uh, sometimes overestimate, so IT, Nigeria, and, uh, and, uh, and Yemen. What you can see is since the implementation of the roadmap, there was a very marked reduction of the number of deaths reported, very close to the 90% that what was what is the target. Since 2021, we have a 50% increase. And that not in the uh, in the in the big five, in the other countries. So of course, uh, again, uh, you know, this is not uh, the, the data need to be interpreted by by caution, but this is what we are seeing, and I really want to use this opportunity also to say that this is not just because countries are not engaged, countries are engaged. The situation which is changing. So another way to look at it, of course, we know and we will discuss again and again today the shortage and the insufficient availability of OCV to respond to outbreak and even more to uh, prevent their occurrence. But the shortage is not just limited to uh, to vaccine. We, the global, and the country and the people, we have faced major issue in supplies because uh, because the outbreak are larger, uh, access to uh, to ORS, to IV fluid, to ringer like that has been extremely challenging. Just because uh, you know there is not enough, we cannot supply the number of cholera kit because you know we cannot uh, the manufacturer cannot produce enough cholera kit. So we have to send uh, in emergency bulk item, and for country to have to rebuild their own kit. This is another illustration of the way that, you know, the, the outbreak is uh, 
uh, affecting the country. So this is just, uh, you know, what was sent from the WHO HQ emergency stockpile. And the emergency stockpile of cholera is supposed to be uh, a safety net, a buffer. <laughs> so, you know, this is not the regular supply that country would ask for, you know, for endemicity. This is just a, another illustration of, uh, you know, the impact of the cholera outbreak we are facing. So uh, again, so that's to 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 summarize, more outbreak, larger outbreak. Again, south of, southern part of Africa uh, and eastern part of Africa, the Horn of Africa, as Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan has seen very clearly the very strong impact of climate change. Three La Nina effect. Now we have another uh, a direct move from La Nina to El Nino, according to meteorologists. Not me. This never happens. To have three La Nina in a row never happened. To have a, uh, a direct uh, El, 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 La Nina, El Nino never happens. Normally, you have a neutral phase in between. Okay. What will be the impact? We don't know. We know that there will be an impact. Of course, you know, cholera is affected, you know, either too much water or not enough water. But in which way? We don't know. So the worst to come, I mean, you know, we might be extremely complicated. So vaccine, we said we are not going to go into detail of the vaccines will come, but you know, we are still in window strategies. There is not enough vaccine to adequately respond to outbreak, of course, even less to prevent the occurrence. And all that in a kind of desert where we have to be very clear, uh, you know, the, the, the engagement and support from the global community to support the cholera response in affected country has been extremely limited. I mean, you know, WHO, UNICEF and others have been trying to get, you know, resources for country. Uh, the buy-in is almost zero. That's a reality we are facing. Okay, so we know there is Ukraine. Now there is, uh, you know, the conflict in Israel. There is there was the earthquake in in uh, in in Syria. Cholera is not on the top of the list. So we need to find a way to change that. I mean, you know, maybe we need to have a cholera outbreak in a G20 meeting or something like that to make it change. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's a reality. Uh, it's extremely challenging to find the right way to support the country which is affected. And again, I would just like to pause on one minute on Malawi. Malawi is a perfect example of the global community failure. It's unacceptable to have seen the country being totally wiped out by, by cholera, having 7% case fatality rate in the capital city just because the country did not have the resources. Oh, yeah, Malawi, it's a poor country. It's not. There is no conflict. There is no mind. There is no interest. But at the same time, Malawi is a perfect example of the success. When finally, you know, the global community realized that, you know, there was something to do, the impact was immediate. So I just want to conclude on the fact that, you know, it's not a fatality. I mean, you know, the uh, the situation is bad, but the strategy exists. We have the, the multi-sectorial strategy. There is no reason. The, the, the problem is not that we don't know what to do. We know what to do. We don't have the resources to do that. And uh, of course, you know, there is no silver bullet. OCV is not the solution. It's part of the solution. We know that WASH is a solution. But who is willing to invest in WASH in the poorest part of the world? So just to give the floor, clearly, we the, the issue we are facing now is just that we do not have enough vaccine. It's not about you know uh, uh, whether outbreak uh, is taking too much or uh, uh, preventive cannot be done. It's, it's a vicious circle. There is no preventive vaccination campaign, so there are more outbreaks. If there are more outbreaks, there is less vaccine for preventive vaccination campaign, and so on and so forth. The only way to break this vicious circle is to find a way to get more vaccine. Not forgetting the rest of the, the, the strategy. Of course, in these two days, we are going to talk about vaccine, but uh, just be reassured that for us, it's very important also to move the other one, surveillance in particular to better target, but also wash and community engagement and case management to ensure that, you know, the, the we will not, we shall not drop the ball. We can still control cholera. Thank you. <laughs>